Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Elisa Modei. I will be chairing uh, this uh, keynote session. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Um, Paula Hidalgo Sanchez. Um, she holds a PhD in geography from the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. And uh, she's currently the, um, a senior program manager at the United Nations uh, Global Pulse Initiative, uh, which is the UN uh, Secretary General's initiatives on big data and AI for uh, um, sustainable development and humanitarian response. Uh, and there, uh, she coordinates the design, development, and deployment of technology prototypes, uh, and she advocates for uh, the responsible uh, use of technology. So I will uh, now hand it over uh, to Paula, and uh, yeah, see you in a bit for the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you, Elsa. <laughs> Thank you, Elsa. Thank you for the invitation to this to this conference. I'm gonna to talk to you about the experimental work of UN Global Pulse and partners to analyze public discourse with AI-based technology to advance the sustainable development goals. Global Pulse serves as the UN Secretary General Innovation Lab and works envisioning a world where responsible, inclusive digital innovation advances sustainable development and protects the planet. I have worked now eight years with Global Pulse, and I'm gonna present you some of the work that I've been doing, especially in the last two and a half years. But let me tell you first about the SDGs. Sometimes in conferences, people say this UN thing. It's not a UN thing, it's a member states thing. In 2015, all UN member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which sets out a 15-year plan to achieve sustainable development by 2030 worldwide, ensuring that no one is left behind. The agenda includes 17 SDGs and 169 targets. These are a universal call for action to end poverty, protect the planet, and improve the lives and prospects of everyone everywhere. When UN Global Post started work using AI-based technologies to advance the SDGs, our premise was to achieve the 2030 Agenda and leave no one behind, all voices need to be heard and people's voices need to be incorporated at the center of policies and programs. <laughs> now, how can people's voices be heard at large scale? private sector does it with social listening. Social listening is used for decades now by private sector to monitor what customers say about products, brands, or services over the internet in blogs, news, social media channels, etc. Social listening is normally applied to public social media forums. So Global Pulse and Partners started doing extensive experimental work to analyze content in social media channels to advance the SDGs. One of the research areas that we explored was to find correlations between online and offline violence. This is some experimental work that we did in Somalia, analyzing what people were saying about the UN Amazon, the UN peacekeeping mission and Al-Shabaab at the time. <laughs> Now, continuing with this work, we realized that while in some parts of the world, like here, when we say social media channels, we think about Facebook or Twitter, in most part of the world, the main social media channel is radio. According to UNESCO, radio is the most reliable and affordable medium of accessing and sharing information in Africa. I was based in Kampala for five years before I moved now back to, to Europe. So in Global Pulse, we decided to apply the same logic to analyze written content in social media to spoken content on radio. 
The work of analyzing public discussions on radio started seven years ago in Uganda, where I was based. And as in many other countries in Africa, radio is used there by citizens as the main channel to voice opinions on things, to share reports about incidents that affect their lives and their communities. So the anonymous millions of words that are spoken every day on public radio are a source of digital data that can be used to improve people's lives and advance the SDGs. Public radio discourse, this is my opinion, is of high qualitative value to inform social policies. Why? Because it's anonymous and unconstrained. Opinions expressed on radio are not biased by questions asked by researchers and reveal personal views and bias by fear of judgment. Public discourse on radio is also valuable to advance SDGs because citizens share first-hand reports of incidents that are not recorded anywhere else. With AI-based technologies, public radio discourse is reduced to a structure-rich data set available for analysis. The value of this data set, and this is based on my experience now conducting field work in Uganda, in Somalia, and in Mali, three countries, the value is that it's a source of primary data that surpasses any volume of primary data collected by any traditional method to gather people's voices as surveys, that is available for analysis in near real time, and because, again, contains cit uh, citizens' testimonials and local reports not biased by questions asked by researchers. With the aim to analyze public radio content, first in Uganda, then in Somalia, nowadays in Mali with the peacekeeping mission, that's the current work that I'm doing, Global Post developed a prototype using machine learning neural networks and deep learning net, uh, methods to ensure that the protection of digital rights and the ethical use of the technology we use, the team was guided by two different instruments. And I invite you to go online and find these instruments if you are curious about these uh, available uh, tools. The data privacy and protection principles and the risk, harms, and benefits assessment tool. Both instruments were formulated by the Data Privacy Advisory Group led by UNO Global Pulse. This group was formed by experts from public and private sector, academia, and civil society from all parts of the world. <laughs> so, how does the system, the complex system for public radio content analysis work? Basically, we will speak public radio discussions, public radio news, public radio, not private radio communications. The data is streaming. I'm going to the system that I'm going to present to you now. Then the data is filtered by a set of different uh, filters with different uh, purposes, and then reports can be generated. What are the pieces of this system that we call radio mining pipeline? First, we have the ingestion module. Public radio content is first streamed via IT equipment, and we have three sections for ingestion. We have equipment deployed in fixed locations in the field. Right now, you see here in the, in the logos, here. MINUSMA and OICT, these are the partners of the current program. So this is real now happening in Mali with Global Pulse and partners. So we have the ingestion models, I was saying, we have IT fixed in, in fixed locations in the field. Then we are also streaming online radio, is radio that broadcasts over the internet. And we have now developed an experimental operating system to stream also data from mobile locations with a mobile phone, basically. It's all cloud-based system. Then we have a set of filters, as I was explaining. We have the first filter for music. 40% of radio content, I will say worldwide, it's, uh, it's music. So we want the music out. For that, we have a filter that takes out the music. Then we have developed also 
language ID filters. In Mali, as in many other countries, when there is a multilingualism, the radio content broadcasted is a mix of different languages. It starts in Bambara, then jumps into French, then down to Bambara, etc. So we have developed these language ID filters for different languages. Then <laughs> we move to the transcription modules. We have different ones. Now, the radio stream goes into a speech-to-test module based on a large vocabulary automatic speech recognition system that uses multilingual acoustic modeling. The model provides a full transcription of the audio content within the confines of a defined uh, vocabulary. Then the stream also goes to, where am I? Yeah, what we call the ASR free. It's an experimental piece that we call the ASR free. It's an alternative to the ASR system and the alternative applies neural networks based pattern matching directly to the speech signal. The advantage of this approach is that it's based on training data consisting in a very small data set of isolated keywords, uh, which might be easier to collect and annotate than the resources required to build ASRs. And I say ASRs for this work in Mali, we have built with partners at Stellenbosch University, we have built ASRs for Bambara and Masina full full day. For you in Uganda, we develop ASRs for Luganda, the way English is spoken in, in Uganda, and also for Acholi. The last part here is the destruction of the radio mining outputs for analysis. So the outputs consist of text transcripts and audio clips that are streamed into the module. Analysts can extract content with data mining techniques using queries defined with selected keywords and key phrases, as for example, floods, refugees, or health. The extracted data is later assessed by analysts that select the relevant content. Now in this system, the most challenging part is this one is building the ASRs. Why? Because it's difficult in itself, unless you're Google and you have the resources that Google has. We're talking about environments that are very volatile. Mali is a, is a country that is in conflict right now. So in Mali, the challenges to engage with people working on the ground, to engage with academia working on the ground and to collect training data. And it's also challenging because some of the languages are oral, are of oral tradition. There are no written uh, standard things about these languages. So if you need to, if you're trying to develop an ASR, you're trying to produce something writing from an oral language, how do you do that? How do you preserve the integrity of the language? You need linguistics to support you on that. So it has quite some uh, complexities. That's why we opted for this, what we call ASR free. You might have heard about the efforts that Mozilla Foundation is doing worldwide. They are collecting quite a large amount of training data to develop this uh, alternative version. Again, in the context of Mali, it's extremely challenging because there's a conflict. There are bombs dropping. Okay, there are attacks happening. People is is being murdered on a on a regular basis. So it's quite challenging to to do the collection of training data in this context. But we, we manage and it works. That's the good news. <laughs> now, let me tell you uh, two examples about how this technology is used. It's being used to support the response to infodemics. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization, WHO, built Infodemic Response Alliance, bringing together ministries of health, civil society, media, and young actors to ensure early warning on misinformation related to COVID-19. Young Global Post contributed to this effort, building a tool to analyze public online radio across Africa to detect trends in misinformation related to COVID, such as rumors about vaccines, prom uh, promotion of false cures, etc. In this case, because of the rush, because of the pandemic and the context, the ASRs use are off the shelf, and it's uh, the content analyzed was in, in English and in French, but it was across the continent and on, uh, based on online radio stations. It's quite a lot of online radio stations uh, across Africa. The results of the radio data analysis 
were used by WHO and partners to develop content for public campaigns and training journalism and community radio stations to tackle the issues related to misinformation. Second uh, case that is currently used, as I was explaining, currently used in Mali with our partners in the peacekeeping mission, MINUSMA. Um, the technology is currently used to support peace and security efforts. This is the program I've been working for the last two and a half years. And the work is about customizing this prototype that we develop for all the contents to the reality of the peacekeeping mission in, in MINUSMA. And how is this helping the mission? It's helping with context analysis. It's helping the mission to know what is happening outside the mission. One, the MINUSMA uh, peacekeeping mission is one of the deadliest uh, in history. So more peacekeepers have been killed in that mission than, than in other places. So that's quite a problem. So this tool helps them to first understand what is happening outside. Okay. Then alerts provide real-time warnings on risk and threats. And this helps them for greater comprehensive situational awareness, detection of potential crisis, improving security of UN personnel, faster support for protection of civilians, detecting trend, uh, trends and ch changes in public views, enable active counter propaganda. This one is, is very important uh, lately in the context of the, of the mission. Now, I thought it would be useful in the context of this conference to talk about adoption. Sure, you're all doing fantastic uh, research. A lot of it will be applied, but sometimes you encounter these challenges for the research, for the technology, for the results of the analysis to be adopted. Why? So I thought it would be relevant to share my experience. In this case, it's challenges that I found for adoption on tools that are specifically for analysis. It might be different that other tools that are for planning purposes, we've seen some of them, but in my case it's for analysis and specifically on social listening. Because when you see this presentation, it's like, great, I want it. No, and normally everybody says, yeah, I want it. But then it doesn't really happen. It really takes a lot of years. I've been working now in this for seven years in this type of technology. And for the first time, there is a UN entity on the ground that is MINUSMA that is adopting it. It has taken us only seven years to get to this point. Okay, so I thought it would be useful because it might help you to think about challenges for adoption of whatever you are working on right now. Okay, so again, might be different challenges. Some of them might be the same. So first challenge, misconceptions about technologies. Not long ago, I delivered a presentation on social listening and how it is used by the, by the UN. And when I came back to the seat, another panelist told me, very scary. Awesome. But I, I said analysis of public media forums. It's very scary. So, okay. So it is my experience that people think many times that socialism is illegal in the hosting country. Okay. People also think that social listening is intelligence analysis done by intelligence agencies. Again, private sector is doing it on a daily basis, on an ongoing basis, all the time to analyze what people say about things. When we try to do it for the SDGs, some people say think is illegal. Some people say you're doing intelligence work, which is not the case here. So why this misconception? Why people think like this? Because of lack of capabilities. Again, it's my experience that sometime going to, to a UN group office mission and to jump into explaining what radio mining is, and then stopping and thinking, wait a minute, do you know what data mining is? And people say, no, okay, okay. let me go back then. I'm trying to explain you radio mining that is a bit more complex, but you don't know what data mining is. So sometimes we assume that people know things that we know, and that's not the case. And people normally don't ask or don't say, I didn't get it, or don't say, I don't understand. Yesterday I said to a speaker, I didn't get most of what you say. And he looked at me like, what? Say, well, yeah. So, you know, um, but normally audiences don't, don't have this, this, this reaction. So we don't need to, to assume because when people think uh, that where you're 
proposing to do is illegal, uh, then they feel threatened. So people fear uh, uh, reputational risk within the community serve, reputational risk with hosting governments and partners, which could, uh, could lead to strained relationships, and personal security risk on the ground particularly in volatile environments. I remember when we tried to do this work in, in Somalia, well, we did it for two years. We had real challenges to just even place the equipment in a, in a server because personnel on the ground fear so much about this radio mining thing that they didn't even want to host the equipment. So at some point we have to put the equipment in the ceiling of a conference room. Okay, because nobody wanted to even host this equipment out of fear, okay, of the whole radio mining thing, thinking it's illegal, thinking it's <coughs> it's um, other type of, of, of work, is intelligence and analysis. Second challenge that I encounter, AI technologies perceived as black boxes by the users. My experience developing AI-based applications requires skill sets that are traditionally not available inside organizations working to advance the SDGs. As a result, such applications are designed and built with external expertise, including data scientists, data engineers, AI experts, US designers, etc. The lack of technical expertise in-house often results in perceiving AI-based applications as black boxes. This is reinforced by a general, and this is my personal opinion, general lack of transparency and accountability of algorithms and methods used to build AI's, AI based applications, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. So, <coughs> my, my empirical experience bridging between users and developers is that, that there is limited dialogue between them. And there is the limited dialogue to co-design solutions together. As a result of this limited dialogue, the possible biases by design that can be introduced either from training data or by the background of the developer are not identified, addressed, or corrected. Sometimes there is limited real world value of some AI-based technologies, developers, as developers do not fully understand the user needs on the ground. There are risks associated to the use of AI-based technologies as developers sometimes do not fully understand the political context where the users are going to use these applications. There is also sometimes wrong application of the technologies by the users because they don't understand how algorithms are, are built. Let me give you an example on, on this one. Recently, Facebook released, produced what they call the Social Connectivity Index. This index measures the strength of connectedness between two geographical areas. The connectedness index is built calculating number of friendship links of Facebook users between geographical areas. A colleague of mine recently shared this connectedness in this saying, look, the social cohesion index that Facebook has produced. Now, social cohesion relates to the strength of relations among the members of a community and the sense of solidarity between its members. It's not about friendship, okay? Sometimes what it happens also is as users see uh, AI-based technologies as black boxes that just does think, if I don't know how it works, how do I know that it works? I don't want it. And I've seen this a lot. Third challenge out of four. Fear of losing jobs. Remember, this is about social listening and analysis might be completely different with other tools, technology research for planning purposes or for other purposes. But for analysis, I found this very often. So fear of losing jobs when AI technology enters the workplace does not only apply to manufacturing companies, but it also applies to other work environments. The introduction of 
AI-based methods often automate processes that were previously done manually. Automatic processes bring higher speed, complexity, and scope to the processes. But it is my experience that personnel that were conducting manual tasks, as for example, monitoring social media to identify terrorist groups propaganda, feel threatened when AI-based solutions automatize the work that they are doing. Now, the fear of losing jobs is not justified for the introduction of the technology because automatic methods are only valid when combined with human experience because humans ensure the accuracy, bias control, and validity of automatic processes. Let me share with you an example of this. The English word refugee in Acholi of Uganda is translated as luring ayela. The literal meaning of luring ayela is runner of problems in English. So when mining content about refugees on public radio in Uganda in a Choli language, we will find a lot of content about runners, athletes, and about people with problems in general. Now, you need a human to clean up and correct these, these biases. And last challenge, poor understanding of new digital data sources. With other technologies, new digital data is available to advance the SDGs. New data that was never available at the scale that is available now. But poor knowledge of a new digital data source and methods to analyze them leads analysts to conclude that the data is not representative and that is biased. Traditional methodologies of primary data collection, such as surveys, used by many organizations, utilize a sample from the universe of analysis to extrapolate characteristics of the target population. Data representativeness is the principle used to draw conclusions from a small sample for a large population group or territory. Now, analyzing large volumes of digital data requires a different way of looking at data. Available digital data sources might not fully represent the universe of analysis, but nevertheless have a value. There is a need to change the mindset to understand that digital data that is rapidly produced at large volumes provides dynamic information on a universe of analysis rather than a static photograph of characteristics at a given time. Commonly, a lot of time is spent on extracting patterns on, and information from the data set, while little time is invested in understanding the data source. All data sources are biased in a way or another. The system of biases in data does not make the data useless. Making sense and extracting insights of a new detailed data source requires that the analyst first know the data source, understand the data set, including the biases on it, and its representativeness. Then adequate methods of analysis can be designed and the analysis results can be interpreted uh, accordingly. I'm gonna stop here for questions, but just, I'm gonna ask myself a question instead of you. How can these challenges be addressed? In my experience, a lot of time, effort and resources are spent on the methodologies, but little yet on the capabilities of the users that are gonna be receiving these methodologies that need to be participating in the design and that need to be using also these methodologies. So I think it's about investing also in the capabilities of the, of the users. Elsa, we stop here for questions. Thank you so much. I think this is um yeah very interesting results for this community to know about all the projects and uh, yeah let's see if we have questions or maybe suggestions <laughs> to your questions from the public. Mm -hmm. I see one hand raised up there. Oh, or here as well. <laughs> um, 
Thank you so much for this talk and all of your challenges were, you know, really spot on. One of the things that I've been um, exploring with some from the U.S. and one of the things that our local health departments are exploring is when we have social media and we look at these signals about misinformation, especially integrating those signals into our regular public health reporting. So I was wondering if you've explored in your use cases, in the places that you've worked, if this can be one other data point that a decision maker can triangulate or use, and it can be automated, like automatically integrated into some of the things that they already use for decision making, but it's more proactive than reactive, because I think that's the unique aspect of how real time what you're doing is. Thanks. Or maybe we just. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And when I was in Uganda, we worked with Ministry of Health quite a bit on this, and that was the, the challenge. How do we how do we include this? Same situation, we're producing these monitoring reports, we have all these data sources. So the answer was what I said before. First, we need to know the data source in order to make sense of it. Okay, it's not only about jumping into extracting insights and where do I fit them. First, we need to understand how it behaves. Okay, so in the case on the radio, for example, I would say to people, do you know how many radio stations are listened to in this area? Do you know the programs that are listened to? Who speaks in those programs? All this is about understanding the data source. So I think it's the same with social media. First, understand the data source, then understand the behavior of the data source to then dive into the data that you care. But the behavior is very important. So that part is normally missing. People jump into, I want to take some data that will fit into me. And I will say, no, look at it. Because maybe what will make sense to you will not be what is said, but the behavior. Just to give you an example, in the context of Uganda, with radio, we realized that whenever there were clashes with uh, um, civilians uh, and, and the government forces uh, in remote rural areas, the radio stations will go off. So it was about the behavior. The early warning sign was not what people said on the radio, it was the behavior of the, of the source of the data. So I think it's really worth spending time in understanding the, the data source, understanding the behavior overall, and then diving and finding, you know, and then you you will see. Uh, yeah, in the case of Uganda, what was useful for the government at that time when I was there was to corroborate with testimonials what other studies were saying. So main problem, for example, was the absenteeism of doctors going, <laughs> we will show up in the health center and there will be nobody, there no doctors. So there were many, many reports of people talking about this absenteeism so the ministry of health said this makes this helps me i've been saying this long time to you know to the to the other uh, parties in government but they don't believe me here i have daily testimonials of people saying there's no doctor in other cases they're charging me for what i'm not supposed to be charged so it needs to to be you know what fits you what serves you yeah so spending time on it yeah Hi, um, thank you. Thank you for the amazing talk. Um, so one question that I was having is that like, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, my, my experience at least from, from the global south is that um, when you have an authorita authoritative um, government, which I don't like to be honest, I don't know uh, if it's the case in Mali or in Uganda, um, radio seems to have like some sort of bias um, I mean, like, I don't know, but be, given like the government doesn't want something to be said or something like that. So I, I, I mean, I can exactly what you were saying about like how it, it's important to understand the behavior of the data source. Um, I don't know if you found this kind of, of particular behavior and how do you deal with this kind of bias, particularly for security and, um, yeah, security problems. Thank you. Yeah. Again, this is an example of specific bias that you might find in the data source in a specific context. We saw a similar situation in Somalia. In Somalia, our partners were the political affairs division of the UN. And first thing they told us, it's not gonna be anything about terrorism on radio because it's a huge censorship 
and radio stations are afraid, you know, of bringing any type of content because then the government goes and closes down the radio station. So he said, we're not going to find anything about terrorism. So well, fine. Is that what you want to find on conversations on radio? I know. Want to know what people say about the elections? Okay, then let's look into elections. So it's fine. As long as you know your data source and the behavior of your data, you can try to make use of it. If any, maybe there is no use, but why do we think that there is a use? And I spent many, many years in the UN as an analyst. Why do we have this faith in surveys? You know, every country, every INC keeps on doing surveys, any NGO keeps on doing surveys and surveys and surveys. We have this strong faith in that what comes out of surveys is, is very good quality. And what comes out of thousands of people speaking on a daily basis in a public forum is not. Well, it's all about finding, you know, understanding your data source and understanding your data. So, yeah, depends on the context, depends on what for. Sometimes you might say it's not useful for this, but that's what I say. It's not possible to fit methods of analysis of a small data into what it used to be called big data. It just doesn't fit. It needs to be different. You need to understand how the data behaves and then you need to see what is it useful for you and what methods to develop to analyze them, to analyze it. We have a question already. Um, so you can take it. Yeah, that's it. It just turned on this mic. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, we have a question from Michaela. Uh, thank you for this talk. It is refreshing to hear a talk about uh, working with data sources in the developing world. Are there other similar projects within the UN on other parts of the world, like South, uh, um, South or Southeast Asia? Hmm. So I think Elsa can answer that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of it. This was uh, when Global Boss started over 10 years ago. Nobody was talking about this in the UN system. Now there's plenty of work uh, in the UN system, development agencies, bilateral cooperation, NGOs. There's plenty of work now. Data scientists are hired now almost normally, you know, to work for, for the SDGs. So it's becoming yeah, quite, a normal, quite a normal thing. So there are many, many examples uh, on fight against hunger, emergency response, uh, quite a lot of work about um, using satellite imagery for emergency response, for disaster response, after disaster response, et cetera. It's quite a lot on that, yeah. You also have a lab in Jakarta, right? Or... Yes. yes, yeah, yeah. Another question up there? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a, a little bit more about the last step of your pipeline, of the pipeline, the, like what happens after the um, ASR. So, uh, like, are there anything specific that analysts will be looking for um, in in this like uh, uh, speeches on on the radio, or like you like uh, analyze, like you, you're not looking for specific things, but you just um, uh, go through it and uh, and yeah so that's my question well no, uh, on that part so with text mining techniques basic text mining is applied and then extracts are available for analysis that's what i call the output of the radio mining process those extracts you have two different uh different uh, types of products or outputs. One is the transcripts. The transcripts are, don't have good quality, quality enough because the ASRs are not perfect. We reach the water rate, the, the lowest we could reach in the scope of the resources we are using, again, not being Google, okay? Uh, so it's quite good, but it's never gonna be uh, uh, what Google uh, could do with the resources that they put on this. So that doesn't help much. So for the text mining is good enough, but to work with the transcript is not, as if you're applying ASR to English or to French or to Spanish, then you can work with the output. In this case, with Mambaramas and Apocalypse, you can't. But what we do is to work with the audio, okay? So then there's quite some work between the machines and, and human, and the human analysts have a very important role here because the, the, the product to work with is this audio section. 
Okay, so then we just design a, a user interface that allows categorization, labeling, transcription, translation, and to work all this in the in the platform. But much more could be done, but it's not needed for this user. You know, in the case of WHO, for example, with the test uh, uh, transcript, a lot more could be done and a lot more of data mining techniques were applied. In the case of, of MINUSMA, it's just not needed. You know, it's the unique piece of information that is relevant to find that unique piece of information is more relevant than other things. But we've done some analytical work, for example, uh, I, I produced one of the analytical pieces with MINUSMA that was about the trend on what people were saying about MINUSMA. Not really sentiment, perception, if you want, you know, over time, what were people saying? Was it positive? Was it negative? What were the associations? Because we were lucky because the word MINUSMA was really well spotted by the, by the system, it's quite accurate. So we found really a lot. So it was about what are the perceptions of people? Is it more positive, more negative? What are the topics associated, the other actors associated to MINUSMA over time. So that was interesting, uh, specific uh, product. Yeah. Thank you very much. We are perfectly on time for the satellite, so I would close the Q&A here. Uh, thank you so much, pa Paula, also for allowing for time for discussion. Um, if you're interested in higher order networks, you should stay here. But if you're interested in this kind of applications, please join us in Sala Mozart for the complex systems for the most vulnerable satellite. And let's thank Paul again. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Gracias.